Gunnis Tea, how are ye? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast. We tell Irish myths with music and have a chat about it in the next episode. My name is Sarika and I'm here with my brother Aaron Hegarty. And this week we have the story of Lou Savaldonok told by Sarika. This podcast is brought to you thanks to our Patreon supporters. Thank you. Go to candlelittales.ie to find out more about us or follow us on any social media at Candlelit Tales. Now, Sarika. Tell us a story, will you? The Tua de Dunan had great magic and great powers, great objects and great weapons. But perhaps their greatest treasure was no made thing, no device of magic or of art, but a creature, a beast. A cow. A magical cow that never ran dry. She was called the Glasgowan. And she was peace and she was prosperity. Because with the Glasgowan, no one would want for anything. For how could you want for anything when there was milk flowing like a river, bubbling with cream, ready? to be churned into butter, to be hardened into cheese, to be drank, foaming, and leaving a rim on your lips. With such a cow, prosperity was never out of reach. And the sons of Dian Kecht, the healer, watched over the glass scowan. Coo, Catherine, and Kian. Kian particularly. Kian was particularly conscientious. He cared for the Glasgowan, not just as a beast and as a source of prosperity, but as a creature that he was fond of. Not quite as a pet, but as a good farmer cares for his beasts. So Kian cared for the Glasgowan. Cared that she was cared for. Cared that she was comfortable. Cared that she wanted for nothing. He knew, though, that there were those who would not care for her in the same way. Who would take the Glasgowan only for what she could do. For what she could produce. And it would mean nothing to them the kind of grass that was sweetest to her, or the clover that she had to be kept away from, lest it hurt her stomach. They would only take from her. And Kian feared that someone would try and take the glass gowan, and he became consumed by this fear, so that he did not let her out of his sight. In fact, he was known for walking around the roads of the land with a cow on a leash at his heel. Now one day Kian and his brothers came to the great smith Gubnu. They'd asked for new swords to be made for the three of them and Gubnu of course said agreed. But Kian was nervous of leaving the Glasgowan outside alone and untended even so close to Gubnu's house. And so he asked his brother to hold on to the leash, and Cairn held on to the glass gowan while Kian and Koo went inside. And as Cairn held, thinking to himself privately, this was all a bit of an overreaction by Kian, a little red-headed child approached him, a cheeky little boy, with a twinkle in one of his eyes. And the child said to Cairn, were you supposed to be getting a sword as well? Cairn said yes. But the men in the forge there, said the child, they said they don't have enough to make a sword for you. They're going to keep all the metal for themselves. Only have swords for them. And because you're outside, you won't know till it's too late. At this, 
Cairn dropped the leash of the glass gown and stormed into the forge, only to find his brothers negotiating with Gobnu the smith how to make the three swords for the three brothers. Kian knew at once what had happened. His brother had been tricked and he rushed out of the forge. But the child was gone. And so was the glass gowan too. Kian did not take too long chastising his brother. He wanted to be off. He wanted to find the cow. But no matter how he searched, he could not find her. There was no track or trace left. And so he went to a druid and asked the druid to look for him, to see what could be seen, to see if he could get the Glasgowan back home again, safe. But the druid said that he could not tell and he pointed Cian to a wiser druid than he. This druid too could give Cian no good answer. But he mentioned to Cian that there was another druid, wiser than any other in the whole of the land, and she might be able to help. And so Cian went to Birog over the mountain. Birog of the mountain listened to Kian's story as the fire crackled between the two of them and the shadows danced on the walls of her hut. Kian did not peer too closely into those shadows. He was not sure he would like what he could see. Birog gazed into the fire when she lifted her eyes to Kian after his story fell away to silence, she said to him, You will not get your cow back. The Glasgow is gone to the Fuivara. She will not be recovered. But... There is something that you could do. It's not quite vengeance. But it is fulfillment. There's something of symmetry in it. Something of balance. Her words meant little to Kian, except that his cow was gone and would not be brought back. But not quite vengeance sounded close enough to vengeance for him, so he agreed to go along with her. He doubted his decision when she handed him a woman's dress and told him to shave his beard. But he went along with it. Birog brought him to the coast, bundled him into a boat, and told him not to speak. And she rowed out, the wiry woman, pulling the boat into the waves as Kian sat in the back huddled in unfamiliar clothing, with the wind stinging his bare cheeks, confused and bewildered, but as brave as a man of the Tua de Danon ever was, to trust himself to the witch and the wind and the weather. Birog steered them a course to Tory Island, And there she brought Kian to a tower of glass. And she knocked on the door and she called out, Here is a woman of the Tua de Danon, a lady shipwrecked. And we are the only survivors, the lady and her handmaiden. 
And will you let us in? And will you shelter us from the storm? And the door was opened and suspicious eyes peered out. Kian was led inside, into this tower of glass, and as he looked around him he saw the faces of women, Fomorian women, beautiful and ugly and strange. And when they were brought in, and Kian still held his tongue, and when they were fed and when they were watered, they were told that they could stay the night but no longer. Birog took out a small harp and said that she would repay their hospitality with a song. And she set her fingers to the strings and she played the music of sleep. And as the heads of the women around them began to nod, Birog gave Kian a little kick in the shin and said, get upstairs. Go to her. Kian did not know what her was at the top of the stairs, and his steps were slow and somewhat heavy as he walked up the stairs of the Tower of Glass until he came to the room at the top where the lady of that tower dwelled. And she turned to him with fathomless eyes. Eyes that had been gazing out past horizons all her life. All her life that she had lived in a tower of glass, with a limitless view and no way of getting to it. And the lady of the tower of glass said to Kian, I have dreamed of your face. And she put her hand out and touched his cheek and said, But there was hair on your face before when I dreamed of you. No one would tell me what it meant. And then she took his face between her hands and kissed him on the lips. And Kian of the two at Edanen son of Dian Kecht, spent the night with Ethlin of the Glass Tower, daughter of Balor. The next day, Birog turned them both into birds and they flew back to the mainland, leaving Ethlin in her tower with her vast horizons and her narrow steps. And Ethlin's handmaidens helped her keep the secret until they could keep it no more. For it was the screams of Ethlin in the pains of childbirth that alerted her father, her jailer, Balor, to the fact that she was with child. She bore triplets. And Balor took the babes and cast them over a cliff into the sea. They were swept up in a whirlpool, turned and twisted and two peeled away, diving deeper into the ocean, swimming powerfully, becoming something more, something else. And one was caught up carried on the waves from wave tip to wave tip until he came to the shore where Birog of the mountain was waiting to catch him. And she brought Kian his son. Kian named the child Lou and did his best to raise him. And when Lou was old enough Kian chose a foster father for him, and he asked Mananon MacLear to raise his son. 
Mananon, who had borne him across the wave safely when he was so small and so vulnerable. Now Mananon would be the one to guide him and teach him as he grew. And Mananon delighted in teaching Lou. Not only was this child quick and clever, but he had a curiosity that was boundless. Everything was a delight to him. He had a face that lit up and shone like the sun when he was curious about something, when he was passionate, when he was interested. And there was so much in the world to see that Lou's face never stopped shining brighter and brighter with each new discovery. But it was not just one thing that Lou excelled at. Lou loved all skill, all arts. He was fascinated by the blacksmith and just as fascinated by the white. He would watch the blacksmith forging and shaping the blade on the forge hammering against the anvil until he had a spear blade pointed and sharp and then he was just as fascinated to see how the white would attach the spear tip to the spear haft with perfectly placed rivets and he was even as fascinated by the way that the cup bearer would pour the wine when they sat down to eat in the evening And everything that Lou saw, he was able to do. He was able to master. He apprenticed to everyone. He learned from everyone. But this did not engender in him arrogance. Only a deep and abiding respect for the arts of other people. For the skills that they had and the talents and the ways that they had made the world a better and a brighter place by bringing their passions to bear, by crafting something else, by doing something that no one else was doing, by executing their gifts with as much skill as they could manage, by honing them sharp. And Lou learned that however sharp one hones one's gift, there is always more honing to be done, more depth to be found, more skill, more improvement. He knew enough to know that he never would know everything. And that thought did not defeat him. It gave him such a passion for the world and all its secrets and all its skills. The land in which Lou grew up, though filled with people of art and skill, was not a happy one, nor a peaceful. The people were under terrible taxes, under rulership of a terrible king. And as Lou came of age and was ready to enter manhood, his world stood at the brink of war. And he knew that the people of the Tua de Danon were gathering under Nuada of the Silver Arm at Tara to make preparations for a great battle against the people of his mother, the Fomorians. Mananon took Lu aside one day and told him The people of his father were going to fight against the people of his mother. They were going to try and cast them out, overthrow them, so they could no longer oppress them with taxes, steal their livestock and their grain and their children. And he told Lu too that their great general, Balor of the Evil Eye, could not be stopped 
except by one who was prophesized. One known as the Savaldanuk, the master of all. Now Lou looked carefully at his foster father. And he said, I know much, but I don't know all. And Mananon said, no one does, not even I. Lou chewed on his lip for a moment. Is it not a prophecy also that Balor will fall at the hand of his grandson? He asked. There is that, said Mananon. That child exists. His father is Tua de Danon. His mother is Ethlin, Balor's daughter, who lives in a tower of glass on Tory Island. Now he could see Lou's brows knit as he put that together with the stories his father had told him of his mother and that strange night and that glass tower. And Lou looked then at Mananon Maglear and said, Are you telling me that it's me? And Mananon said, It is your choice to take this up or not to side with your mother's people or your father's people or none at all and your choice has a consequence and you should know what it is and the very next day Lou set out for Tara his face shining with purpose This podcast was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan and Rory O'Shea. You can find out more about us on our website, candletales.ie. And we're on all the social media, so like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Candlelit Tales, or send us a message to get onto our mailing list. For more videos and live streams, like and subscribe to our Candlelit Tales YouTube channel, which now has a Candlelit Tales for Kids playlist, hashtag Candlelit Tales. Liking and subscribing to our channels really helps us grow and get to more people. And if you're able to give us more direct support, you can chip in a few bob at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or make a one-time donation through the PayPal button on our website. We also do really like to hear back from you with any questions, requests or comments, leave them in the section below. If you want to find out about our courses, anything like that, just drop us a line. And we especially appreciate you listening.